Welcome to the Circle of Birth podcast. I'm your host and advocate, Ali Kranz. These podcasts are here to gather stories, people and information to better our understanding of the wisdom of birth and how we can reclaim our connections to birth from conception and beyond. You will hear stories not only from Australia but from all over the world, bringing together women, partners, midwives, doulas and all the people that have a birth story to share. So jump right in for this next Circle of Birth story. Welcome to episode 34 and you might have noticed it goes for nearly an hour and a half but don't be dismayed by that. This is so inspiring and so informative and a lot of important stuff that we need to talk about, that we need to do. We are joined with Jo Hunter who's a private practice midwife in Australia. Now we have four birth stories and her oldest daughter is 21 years old so we have a great insight into the system then in Australia uh, and her personal journey from a birth centre into a home birth and very beautiful stories and then we enter into her story of becoming a doula with a young family, a childbirth educator and then a midwife. So in this episode, you'll really hear how Jo was a champion for informed choice, continuity of care and all around how we can better support women in maternity, birth and beyond. Uh, very inspiring episode for all birth workers, midwives, student midwives and of course you important pregnant women. Uh, this is a beautiful journey. Enjoy. Uh, welcome Jo. It's a really big honour to have you on the show. Welcome to the Circle of Birth and I know you're a super busy midwife at the moment and I just think it's wonderful that you've come to share your stories and you've got four birth stories and of course your stories into midwifery. Um, and how that's looking for you right now. So thank you for being a part of this show. Oh, thanks for having me, Ali. It's great. I'm stoked to be here. Yeah. And I'm really interested. I'm just really excited to hear about your four birth journeys and even my, my me myself um, having a birth experience and now being a student midwife. So I'd love to hear that how that came for you and coming into midwifery. So how about you start it off and you can tell us a love story. I left, well, first of all, I was born in, in England and we came, we moved over from um, the UK on the 10 pound scheme. So the 10 pound poms, um, it took six weeks on a boat. I'm the youngest of five children and one um, adult paid a full, a full fare and then everybody else paid 10 pounds to get here. And they were basically trying to get English people to move over to Australia. Yeah. And how so old were you then, Joe? I was only three. Yeah. So I don't really have a memory of it. Um but, you know, my oldest brother was 13, so he's got very strong memories of, of what it was like. So, yeah, I, I kind of live it through him, really, for him telling stories. But um, And then, you know, I grew up in the, in the western suburbs of um, Sydney. And when I was 17, I left school and went back to London. Um, and I ended up – well, supposed to only be going for six months but I ended up staying there for three years and um which is where I met my now husband not that I knew that was going to be the case we were just very good friends um and he was seeing other people and I was seeing other people and then um we kind of got together just before I was coming home and he had plans on coming to Australia but you know he had a few things to do and money to save and stuff so it was probably about six months we were apart and then he moved oh he sorry he came to Australia on a year's visa and we lived together and it's kind of the history really that's it that, that's been together ever since so but my husband's an only child so it was a big decision for him to come and live in Australia knowing that he was leaving his mum who his dad had died leaving his mum over there but um she's since immigrated but that's another story yeah. um and what was your pull to come back again after going back to London well it was family it was really family yeah it was really family and friends and you know I love it I love it here and you know, love it it's it's I would never I can't imagine living anywhere else really um I mean it was fabulous to experience living in London and traveling Europe I did a whole six month backpacking tour around Europe with one of my close friends and that was great but I never saw myself living there forever or long term 
Um, and, you know, he came over here and he loved it. So that kind of worked. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so you established, started establishing your family quite quickly? Yeah, pretty quickly. Um, I mean, we'd been together, we'd been living together for three, three years, I think, before, um, or four years when we got pregnant. And I mean, we, we had got married as well. And like, I didn't want to get married for him to be able to get residency here. I didn't want that to be the reason for, for the marriage. So we actually went back to London and got his residency as a de facto relationship. Um, and so we had to live there for a year and we had to prove all sorts of, you know, had stacked decks and joint bank accounts and joint tenancy agreements and all of that stuff. Lovely. And we got his um, residency in Australia. Yeah, that's right. We did actually. There was that. <laughs> all of it. You know, Christmas cards that were written to a whole heap of people from both of us and that sort of thing. Not that we send Christmas cards anymore, yeah. do we? But, yeah. And um, and then so once he got his residency, we came back to Australia and then we decided to ha- uh, get married, um, which is what we did. And then yeah, so we fell pregnant. Just but beyond, before that, because I'm the youngest of five um, kids, I there were, my siblings are quite a lot older than me. My I have a different father to my other siblings. We've got the same mum but a different dad. So, you know, they're, they're sort of ten years older than me. So I became an auntie very young. I was only about ten when I first became an auntie and there was just always little children around and babies and, you know, talk of birth and it just was a – you know, nobody in my family had had a cesarean. You know, it was all sort of just normal birth, really. Mm. Um, and and so my, that, so your perceptions on birth at that age was it was just a normal thing that happened. Totally, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was just you just went in. You, I mean, no one had except for my sister-in-law who did have a home birth. But I'll go get to that in a minute. But um, you know, before her, nobody had had home births, but they'd all just had normal births in the hospital and came home, and it wasn't a big deal. You know, no. no Nobody sort of – it wasn't a, a scary uh, adventure. It was just something you did to get your baby, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I was always fascinated with it. I always was. I was one of those kids that, you know, always had little dolls stuck stuck up my jumper and pretending to give birth, you know. <laughs> I, was, I was always fascinated with it. Um, and I w- would always ask, you know, my, my um, older sister-in-laws and things, I w- was fascinated to find out what – what it was like tell me about it you know and they, they were quite open about talking about it which was really good oh so you asked them about what the birth was like as a child yeah, yeah. I, I distinctly remember particularly one of them that I had a big long conversation I probably was about 13 though when I at that stage but um yeah it was it was definitely a fascination um anyway so and then my sister-in-law had um she had her own midwife for her first baby, a private uh, independent midwife for her first baby. But at the time, the independent midwives in Sydney had visiting rights in the hospital. So um, she took her independent midwife into Paddington Birthing Centre and had her first baby there. And then the second one she had at home with, with a midwife. Um, and that was the first time I'd ever heard of home birth. So that those those they're like 25 and... 28 now though that that niece and nephew um so it was a long time ago and so that that opened my eyes and when I when I found out I was pregnant with um my first baby it was definitely something that I was keen on doing but we had absolutely no money so um I just simply couldn't afford it so we we did the next best best option which I consider the next best best option which was um the birth center in a in a one of the big hospitals in Sydney and were they quite oh. common around that time? What's that? The birth centre. Yeah, 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 they they were actually. I mean, you had to get in quickly, like you had to kind of ring up as soon as you were pregnant or you missed out. But um, it was – there were quite a few birth centres around Sydney at the time. There's very few now. but And there were no continuity of care models. Only independent midwives offered that. I don't even think that it was a, it was a term, continuity of care, I think – you know, so you just got whoever was on shift. But in the birth centre, you pretty much got to meet most of the midwives in your antenatal care. You kind of had someone different each time. Um, so unfortunately, that didn't happen for me. So when I did go in in labour, I didn't know the midwife that was on. But it was it was okay. It was okay. Um, 
So I went into labour at home and it was early. I remember it was early in the morning. My husband had gone to work and Phil, his name is, so I'll just call him Phil from now on. <laughs> and um, <laughs> I sort of got the first little twinge and thought, oh, I wonder if this is it. And it quickly ramped up to um, contractions and I rang him to come home and I laboured most of the day at home, actually. I really didn't want to go anywhere. I really wanted to stay at home. Um, and I remember I spent a lot of my labour on the toilet and I remember him trying to get me into the car and I'd, I'd get off and I'd get halfway down the hallway and start having contraction on and I'd run back to the toilet. <laughs> Is your safe space? <laughs> yeah, I think it took about him about an hour to actually get me in the car. And then we were living right in Sydney in Newtown at the time and um, we had to drive down the main street of Newtown and it was Saturday afternoon when all, everyone was out doing their shopping and we're driving down. I was really in very strong labour. I remember really vocalising with every contraction. And his, he had his window down in the car and I distinctly remember having this massive contraction leaning over the back of the seat and looked out the window and all these people were looking in at me because um, we were parked, we were at a, a red light, you know, on King Street. So I'm like, do your window up. I said to him, I remember that. So um, we got to the birth centre and I was in rip-roaring labour and I basically gave birth about three hours after I'd got there. Um, it was a beautiful water birth um, and my intention was to just stay the four hours and then and then leave. And then, unfortunately, what happened after that was, you know, and I wasn't a midwife then and I knew very little. I mean, I, I was hungry for information during my pregnancy and did lots and lots of reading and did natural birth classes and all the things you do when you're having your first baby. But um, I didn't really understand, you know, the, the politics and the procedures and protocols that happen in hospital. So they, um, I had requested a physiological third stage and um, the midwife was unaware, I think, that that just meant leaving me alone to do my thing. And what she actually did was just not give Sinto. Um, so she continued to do the fundal massage and the cord traction and I started to bleed quite heavily. So they, she rang the registrar who came in and continue to do what she was doing, what the midwife had been doing and, and pulled on the cord and pulled the cord off and left the placenta inside me um, with the cord in his hand. So I then started to hemorrhage um, and I think knowing what I know now, I think what they did was cause a partial separation of the placenta um, and half of it was still adhered to my uterus and the other half was obviously not and there was bleeding coming from it. So um, I went to theatre to have a manual removal. So obviously separated from my baby for about a couple of hours anyway. Um, and once the placenta was out, I stopped bleeding. So I did lose a litre and a half of blood and I was really unwell. I ended up in ICU and um, they gave me two bags of blood. The second bag I had a, an allergic reaction to and ended up completely covered in these big red welts all over my body and um, they wanted to give me more and I declared well I can and I'm going to sign myself out so that's what I did. I um, signed myself out against medical advice and went home feeling really not very well <laughs> but just didn't want to be there, really did not want to be there. Um, so, and was that cord, cord traction a common uh, practice back then? Well, it still is with um, active management of third stage. I mean, you kind of have to do it really to help the placenta out once you've given Sinto because mm. you've got a limited amount of time to get it out before the cervix starts to shut. Mm. But with a with a active, uh, sorry, physiological third stage, no, you shouldn't be you shouldn't be doing cord traction at all. Yeah. Um, you should just let, you know, waiting for signs of separation, which are, you know, a bit of a blood loss and the cord lengthening in the woman feeling a bit of, a bit of heaviness again, a bit of pressure. Um, and then usually you just get, get a woman to use gravity and get upright and it normally just comes out without you needing to do anything. Or if you have to do cord traction, it's the tiniest little bit because the placenta is just sitting there. You're not actually pulling it off the wall, if you know what I mean. Yeah. So, um, and I don't, I mean, I think probably, I mean, I don't, 
blame blame her. I'm not. I don't, I don't feel traumatized by it. Actually, um, I just feel really bummed that they fucked it up. Really. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it could have been really. Uh, you know, if, if they had have just left me to it, my birth the placenta, and not had such a big blood loss, I would have been home four hours later and been feeling very well. But you know, my first week after after giving birth, I just felt terrible because. You know, I'd only had probably half the amount of blood that I was supposed to have because of this allergic reaction. And, um, you know, so I just started taking really high doses of iron and eating really good food. And, I mean, I eventually came good, but it, it did affect my first couple of weeks for sure in terms of energy and feeling well after the birth. And were you feeding, breastfeeding? Yeah, yeah, I did feed. And that, that actually, I mean, apart from, you know, some crack nipples and things, I mean, that... That went very well. I, I loved breastfeeding. Um, <clears throat> so, and, you know, I'd, it was a really beautiful birth. It was great. It was just me and my partner there. And, you know, I was shocked at the lack of um, presence of the midwife in the hospital. I I really thought I was under some illusion that the midwife would just be there the whole time. <laughs> and really she wasn't. She just sort of came in every half hour and listened to fetal hearts and then left again. Um, so it was just... He, he and I, which was in hindsight was great, but it's not what I was expecting. I was thinking that there'd be someone that was kind of there supporting both of us through it, you know. Yeah. And so and how, was, what were I your think. thoughts on after that experience and after the sort of postpartum phase just gently guided out and how were your thoughts on birth after that in general? Do, were you a bit, um, a bit shaded by the experience going into your second no, I wasn't. I thought, no, I wasn't at all. I didn't let it get there. I, I was like, no, I'm going to do it properly next time. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to make sure no one touches that cord. Um, <laughs> so, no, I wasn't. I, I didn't – I wasn't worried about it at all, not in the slightest, which is interesting, isn't it, in hindsight. But um, so then – so she was – that's Jay. She's now – she's 21 next week. Um, oh. okay. And – yeah, she's she's a beautiful human being and was a just a divine baby and child, and so she and she's you know I mean our firstborns teach us so much, don't they? Yeah. Um, and so so then she was two and three months when my next baby was born. So when I found out I was pregnant with her, I did call the birth centre because I was like, well, I'm not going to go to the I'm not going to go to labour ward and I'll see what they've got to offer. So I rang the birth centre, and at the time. I was risked out because I was high risk because I'd had a postpartum hemorrhage. Um, so my choice was to go to labour ward, which there was no way I was going to do, or have a home birth. Um, so obviously the choice to home birth was where we went. Um, and, you know, I mean, we really we really did have no money. We were really young, you know, and I, my husband, yeah, we just we were broke. <laughs> Yeah. So we just scrimped and saved, really, and um, you know our, our midwife let us pay pay it off in a on a payment plan, and every week out of my husband's wage, a little bit would go to the midwife. And um, do you remember it, the cost? It was fifteen hundred dollars. Okay, yeah. So it hasn't yeah. really changed. Well, sorry, it has changed a lot. No, it's, no, it's changed. <laughs> yeah, so it has yeah. changed a lot. What am I thinking? Yes. Yeah. yeah, but that was twenty years ago. Yeah, yeah. So, and would, yeah, would midwife home birth midwives accessible more? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they were. Yeah, and I had a had a beautiful midwife, Maggie Maggie Lecky Thompson, um, and so she. Yes, I mean, it was the best decision I've ever made and it's actually t- taken me on this journey that I'm on now, you know, like I'm just so thrilled that that birth centre said I couldn't birth there. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so her, her Bronte's birth, so Jay's labour was about 12 hours all up from woe to go um, and then Bronte, my next baby, she, I had a five-hour labour with her um, and she was posterior and a lot bigger. So she ended up, uh, my dilation phase, first stage of labour was very quick. It was only two hours, but then I pushed for three hours because she was posterior and, and on her way to turning around. So that was a challenge. That was the challenge in her birth. Um, but I remember after she was born and I was in the pool and, you know, I was kind of thinking, okay, how are we going to do this placenta now? Like, what, what do we do here? And my midwife said to me, just 
you know, we waited for signs of separation. It was very obvious that the placenta was just sitting inside and had come off the ball of the uterus with the blood loss that I'd had. And, you know, I just had that feeling, you know, that feeling you have that that pressure in your bum again, (laughs) that there's something there. And uh, the midwife said to me, just wrap your hand, Maggie said, just wrap your hand around the cord and just give it a little gentle pull. And if it's sitting there, it's just going to come out. And I did that and it, and it came out into my own hand. I, I remember just feeling so triumphant doing that myself and, you know, having had the experience that I had after Jay. Um, so that all went beautifully well. I had very normal blood loss, no problems. Um, and little Bronte arrived, well, big Bronte. She was four, 4.3 kilos. Um, and was Jay your other daughter there? The birth? She was, yeah. yeah. She was there, yeah. yeah. I've made a little film about it actually. It's called Siblings at Birth. I used it, um, I used it as a, I, I presented it, oh, I can't even remember which one it was now. It was the Geelong Home Birth Conference. I think it was 2008. And I did a presentation on siblings at birth and I, you know, had videoed each of the births. So each of them, the children are in it. And then I interviewed them afterwards about what it was like to be there. Oh, um, that's awesome. Yeah, it's cool. <laughs> Jay's Jay's sort of sitting there banging on the edge of the pool, going, "What are you doing, Mummy? Oh, I'm just having a baby." Um, <laughs> and that worked out okay for you. You didn't get a, you didn't get stressed. Yeah, it was, so fine. It was fine. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was yeah. totally fine. I, I liked yeah. I liked having her there, and I liked the just the normal sort of noises of our house going on around me. Um, <clears throat> and so I had. My my girlfriend Lou was at that birth, and she she was the one that was filming it. And my mum was there as well, and my mother in law were both at that birth. So she, my mother in law, had come from England. She came each time I had a baby from overseas, and um, so she they were all there for that one. That was good. Yeah. <laughs> and good so, how, what were their perceptions on you having a home birth? They were very accepting of it. I never got any um, negative comments at all from anyone in my family which yeah I mean it was I guess in my family my sister already had a home birth so my mum kind of knew about it and you know she was from Britain where it's not an uncommon thing like especially in her area in her era you know there was lots of babies born at home not that she ever had any home births herself but yeah I don't think I mean she wasn't worried about it and then my mother-in-law had come from England and you know there's publicly funded home birth through the NHS is not an uncommon thing. So they were all very cool with it. It was fine. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so so the, just, yep. just to draw on a bit of resources, I know you said um, you've, with your first pregnancy you did a lot of natural birth classes and do you recall with these two pregnancies, um, you know, 21 years ago, we're looking at any particular books or anything that you may have watched that may have, um, really inspired you to want the births, the experiences that you wanted? Yeah. Um, well, I've read a lot of Sheila Kitzinger with my first pregnancy and Ina May, Ina May Gaskin. Yeah, uh, okay, yeah. And was her book like Spiritual Midwifery would have been around? Yeah, yeah. it was yeah. around, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, so that was – they were two really big influences. And I remember um, – I remember watching a little documentary which was called The Labour of Love and and Maggie, my midwife, was in it as the midwife and there was two other midwives who were also, they followed a couple of women that were give, giving birth with them and they, it, it was actually on the ABC but you could also buy the, it was a video then, you know, yeah. video recording of it. Um, and so I, I remember seeing it on television and then, um, my midwife had a copy because obviously she was in it. And actually my brother, who's a musician, who also had the same midwife, the one that had the home birth, he wrote the music for it, for The Labour of Love. Wow. So, yeah, so that was a lot like, you know, we're talking 28 years ago. Do you think I could find it? Does it still kick around somewhere? Yeah, totally. I've got a copy of it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I have. So I'm, I'm happy to share it with you. So, yeah, they're probably the things that influenced me the most. So then we moved. Um, we moved from Sydney up to the Blue Mountains, um, and weren't really planning on having well any more just yet. I, I sort of felt that there was probably more babies, but I wasn't really planning it. But when um, Bronte was three months old, I found out I was pregnant. Um, well, she was. How old was she? Three months? 
she was 14 months when Riley was born. So what would that be? Um, <laughs> Any mouse, uh, any mouse not, questions left, 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 left. pieces. So she, she would have been four, <laughs> four months, four months yeah. old, yep. Yeah. <laughs> and I hadn't even had a period. I was like, mm. I just, my, my first thought was I got heart, I used to get quite bad heartburn in pregnancy. That was the first sign for me that I was pregnant. Yeah. And I started getting heartburn. I was like, you're kidding. <laughs> no way. And, of course, I did a pregnancy test. And it, and it was, I had a very faint second line and I remember showing my girlfriend and I'm like it's not really there is it it's just it's really faint it's just like oh, yourself, I yeah. think it's there anyway <laughs> so you so, were breastfeeding at the time were you yeah around the yep. clock so yep. you, you've like done the typical you know you can still get pregnant while you're breastfeeding people. yeah I'm a perfect example of that yeah <laughs> yeah um so, of course, it was a no-brainer. I was going to have another home birth. But then if we were up in the mountains and my midwife was in Sydney and I didn't want to have another midwife. I wanted our beautiful midwife, Maggie. So um, that was a – I mean, I, I never I, – I got a little bit of morning sickness, but I was I really enjoyed being pregnant. It was I never had a really hard time being pregnant. Um, so then what happened after that? So I went into labour with him, he's my only son, um, and it was very fast. And my girlfriend Lou was there again, his dear friend, and she was very pregnant with her second baby. She was actually more pregnant than I was, but I'd gone into labour a bit earlier than her. And we called my midwife and she was coming obviously from Sydney and and it was peak hour, it was in the morning like 6 a.m. or 7 a.m. or something. So she didn't make it. So the baby was born before she arrived. I remember I remember getting in the pool and ringing and saying, you know, where the fuck's Maggie? And <laughs> and, Lou, and I think my husband might have rung her and said, where are you? And she said, I'm at Labston Hill, which is just at the bottom of the mountains. And I was – I was holding back. I, I was really holding back because I wanted her to be there, and I. But this baby wasn't going to wait. So, um, and she said exactly what I needed to hear. In because my husband Phil held, held the phone up to me, and she said, "I'm at I'm I'm at Lapston Hill, but if the baby arrives before I do, it will be totally fine." So I'm like, "Okay," and then I just pushed him out. Mm. So um, and my girlfriend Lou, who was 39 and a half weeks pregnant, caught him. <laughs> Um, which was cool. We've got great footage of that with her big pregnant belly and wow. um, I was kind of on all fours leaning over the pool and I needed Phil to be right in my face next, you know, I was eyeballing him. So someone needed to be behind to catch the baby. I suppose I could have, but I, I was, it was just, it was like a freight train going through, you know, it was a two hour labour. Um, so, and she walked in about five minutes after he was born, my, my midwife. Um <laughs> Isn't that just the best words that the midwife can say to you, though? You know, it's like it just she must have known it was right at that crucial time. And, um, you know, if it's like, you know, wait till I get there and put you in that sort of panic mode, then it could have went different as opposed to it's going to be, you know, I'm coming and um, it'll be all right. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. yeah. I've learnt, I learnt, I've learned an awful lot from her and I implement things that she said to me in my own pregnancy and birth and postnatally every single day in my own practice. I mean, you know, I couldn't have got a better teacher really. Um, so, and she's a dear, dear friend still. I, I adore the woman. Um, so two hours, that's pretty quick. How did you feel um, just sort of directly after that? Was it, like you said, it was a bit of a railroad quick trip? Um, yeah, it was a bit quick. I mean, you know, I was kind of... It was fine, but it, it would have been nice if it had been a bit longer. Um, and, I, and, you know, as, as much as everything went beautifully well and it wasn't a problem, I kind of still – I was a bit bummed that my midwife wasn't there purely because for the fact that I wanted to share it with her, not because I was worried about something going wrong. Um, and I just would have, would have loved to have had her presence there really. But what can you do? You know, babies come when they're ready. So, um, so that was cool. And then we were done. We weren't having any more. Yeah. Um, Phil was supposed to go and get a vasectomy, which he didn't do. <laughs> and of course, I found out I was pregnant again. Um, 
and we don't know how she came to be. We still don't know how it ha- that one happened. But anyway, it, it, she did. She was waiting in the wings and decided she was going to join our family. So, And how soon um, after was she coming? So she was born um, – so my, she, my son was 21 months when she was born. So it was pretty quick. <laughs> so, so they were – when Maya was born, Riley was 21 months – Bronte was three and Jay was five. Mm, I'm seeing a pattern here, very quick conceptions and quick births. <laughs> yeah, it's like you, know, <laughs> you know, learn what makes you get pregnant. Yeah. <laughs> we just have to share the same bath water. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, dear. So, Good of course, swimmers. again. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, of course, again, we were going to have another home birth. Um and so all my other babies were born. Jay was born at 39 weeks and Riley and Bronte were born at 38 weeks. So I was expecting another, you know, 38, 39 weeker. And she went beyond 42 weeks. Um, and I think now, looking back on it, I think I, I absolutely knew it was the last time I was going to be pregnant. I, I was not having any more. And um, I think there was a little part of me that was holding on to it, to be honest. At the time, I just couldn't wait to get her out. But um, I think there was a little part that was like, oh, I don't, I don't want to let this go because I know I'm never going to be pregnant again, you know. Yeah, that's a really interesting thought to reflect on. Um, I think about that a bit, you know, if I have another pregnancy, will I be, because knowing that it'll be probably one of the last, will I be just holding on to that and trying to absorb every moment of it? Um, yeah. When in previous pregnancies, you're always just like, oh, I can't wait to, you know, get to this and this and this and this. And it's like a little yeah. child growing up. You just want to grow up really quickly. But, yep. yeah, that feeling of when you know, like, this is it and everyone's here and, yeah. It's yeah. also the same with – I found it was the same with babies as well. Like my first daughter, I, you know, it was so exciting to sit up for the first time and start crawling and get teeth. And, you know, I remember – being excited to get to the next stage all the time. And with the last one, I wanted to bonsai her and just keep her. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> little newborn and don't do anything and or move or yeah. just keep breastfeeding, you know. So her birth was very, very quick. I, I um, the first contraction I called the midwife. And so she did make it, but only just. And so her labour was from first contraction to birth was an hour and 15 minutes. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, it was full on, and I wouldn't recommend it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, it was great. I mean, of course, I loved, I loved it, but it was, I was kind of left with. Oh, I've been waiting nine months for this birth experience, and it's over in an hour. You know, yeah. so, um, and I did go into a bit of, you know, I remember having that big adrenaline hit that sometimes women that have really fast labors get and start, get really shaky afterwards. You know, I remember doing that sort of uncontrollable shaking after she was born. Um, but, you know, never had another problem with placentas. They all birthed beautifully and never had another postpartum hemorrhage. Um, so the fact that I was considered high risk was a bit ridiculous, really. Um, <clears throat> and so, yeah, she, she was born, Maya, her name is, and she's, she's, um, 15, nearly 16 now. Um, she's a beautiful girl too, and as are all my kids. Um, so how yeah. was the postpartum with number four? What was life we like? We got it right, actually, this time, because my husband, Phil, took a month off work. Um, with the others, he kind of had a week or two, and it was just not – having so many small children close together, um, especially with the third one, I found it quite difficult with him going back to work because, you know, Bronte was only 14 months old, so she was still waking through the night as well. And, you know, and he was on, he was a shift worker, so sometimes he wasn't there at night. Um, which is the t- time where you kind of really need them. <laughs> um, so, yeah, with our last, he, he took a month off postnatally and we just had a beautiful baby moon together and with all the kids there. And um, I had t- I'd said to my mother-in-law, please don't come for until the month's up because uh, each other time she had been there right from the, the word go. And that kind of changed things. You know, they – they were coming from Britain, so that was kind of a holiday for them. And you know, it was my husband had it was he was seeing his mum again, so he felt that he needed to entertain her and be spend time with her and be with her as well. I completely understood, but it took away from the fact that I just had a baby and that I really needed him to be really present for that. Um, so for the last one, it, yeah, it took it took four babies to get that that postnatal period right and it was beautiful and I I always highly recommend to women now to 
really um, just enjoy and be in that little baby moon for the first few weeks because it goes so quickly and you never get it back again. And did you find, you, you know, you're a bit more present with number four just purely because you knew that that was it for you as well, trying to absorb as much of that as you can? Yeah, I think so. But also I still had three other very small children that needed me, you know. So, yes, I was, but also I was – it was just the whole family unit were, were together and we weren't being disturbed by anybody being in our space. And it was, it was really lovely. And, and the kids all, I mean, they were all there for each of the births. Um, so they all just, it was just another day, like, you know, yeah, when baby's born and there's another one that's joined the family. <laughs> no, no one kind of got jealous or it was just natural progression to the next stage. You know, it was really lovely. Yeah. And I loved having a lot of little, I mean, before I, before I was um, a midwife, I was a preschool teacher. So I loved having lots of little kids around. And it was I look back on that time. I mean, it was hard. I mean, I, I, it was bloody hard. It was not a lot of sleep happening. But um, I, I do look back on that time of my life as, as some of the best times. And I, I try to say to women now, you know, with little kids and they're feeling frustrated. And, you know, I felt it as well. Of course I did. We all do. But... I just want to say to them, just cherish it because it goes in the blink of an eye. You've got teenagers and life's very, very different, you know, so, yeah. yeah. Good advice. So was there a point in between these four children that you wanted to be a midwife? Yeah, yeah. I, I wanted to be I, I wanted to be a midwife from the first birth, really. Um, <clears throat> but I didn't, you know, I knew I wasn't going to be able to, you know, with all these small children, Um I needed to to give it some time. So what I did do was I I, I was attending births actually. I, I was asked by lots of friends to to go to their births as a support person, which of course I jumped at every time. And then um and then I did doula training with Denise Love. She was it was the first doula course that was offered in Sydney, and um I I jumped at it and went and did doula training. So and. So then I started attending births and another girlfriend of mine that lives up here in the mountains, she had done it as well. And it was this new phenomenon. I mean, it was an age old profession really, but no one had heard the word doula. It wasn't something that was ran off people's lips. And I remember there was one time um, one of one of my clients had been into the hospital to say, you know, well, this is my birth plan and, my, you know, my partner's going to be there and I'm going to have a doula. And the, the midwife went, who's a doula? I thought, she thought it was like someone's name, you know. Um, so we start. We we um, set up. I also did through NACE, the National Association of Childbirth Educators. I did a childbirth education course. So and so this was, you know, when the kid. I don't think I'd even had Maya yet then, and so we were running childbirth classes um, and offering doula support. And so a lot of our doula work would come from the childbirth classes like we'd have lots of couples come to these classes and then maybe half of them would hire one of us as a doula were your first birth experiences that weren't your own was that with friends or was, yeah 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 Lou who had attended my births Lucretia um who's a dear friend and our families are very close and our kids are all still very close um she so she also had Maggie as her midwife and her, we met when we were pregnant with our first babies. And for us, well, it was my third baby but her second because, <laughs> you know, I got I snuck another one in there. Yeah. In between. Um, I was at her birth. So I was, you know, so she caught Riley when she was 39 and a half weeks pregnant and then I went to her birth six days later um, and that was the home cool. birth. And I had Riley there and he was breastfeeding and, we, yeah, it was lovely, beautiful. So that was the first birth other than my own that I've attended. And they, they're they nearly 19, those two. Right. And how was that for you after that experience? Did, did that just like, you're like, right, this is it. Like, I'm definitely like, yeah. be a part of this. And, yeah. 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 Like all the time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was a complete birth nerd. Yeah. <laughs> um, couldn't get enough. You know, fun on a Saturday night was watching birth videos. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like me now. Like, <laughs> my poor partner always walks past and he's like, oh, I'm watching birth stuff again. That's what yeah. my son's like, oh, Mum, are you watching birth things again? <laughs> well, that's actually in, in my little um, siblings at birth DVD. One of the kids, I can't remember which one now, 
when I because because with my last one I um, labored through the night well, through the night all all one hour of it it was dark and so the kids were in bed and I think it was Bronte said when she came up you know she heard m- the, my birth noises she thought I was watching a birth video oh, shit. <laughs> that's what she thought was happening and then she came out and realized oh, I was actually mummy in labor yeah, it's true it's <laughs> real time <laughs> <laughs> so funny um, so you so you had the dual the and the childbirth education happening and uh, how old were you then? Um, I was late 20s. Late 20s and still yep. sights set on studying midwifery. Yes, but I was... you been nursing, you would have had to study. Yeah, yeah, yeah. which was my major reason for not doing it. Yeah. Was that I, I didn't, I, was, I had no interest in being a nurse whatsoever. I just wanted to do midwifery and to study nursing and then to do midwifery, it was just like, oh, I don't know, I don't know if I want to do that, you know. So that was a big turn off um, and then... We found out that they were trying to do – Oh, in, in all of this time, I was also very heavily involved in advocacy. So I um, I started off – when Bronte was born, I became the coordinator of Home Birth Access Sydney um, and then from that ended up being the national convener for Home Birth Australia. Uh, and we were very – I was working alongside Justine Keynes um, from Maternity Coalition at the time, and she's an amazing sort of powerhouse consumer activist who made a lot of amazing, incredible changes to mat- the maternity system and, and, you know, politics around it. Um, and so we we were kind of working together and very, very heavily involved in lobbying, lobbying and advocacy. Um, so that was all sort of happening on the – on the side of having all these little kids. And she had a horde of children too. She, I mean, she ended up having seven, I think. But um, at the time she she probably had about four kids as well. Um, and we'd go off to, you know, organise rallies all over the place and just <laughs> strap our kids to us and bring them along, poor kids. Um, <laughs> it was great. It was a great time. Um, and there was a lot of – there was a real lot of consumer activism happening. Like, you know, it was, it was very easy to rally up a good – amount of people to, for any sort of event that you were trying to make happen. Um, so this was more directed to with home birth in particular, was this more at like insurance for home birth midwives and that type yeah. of thing? Yeah, yeah. So, and I mean, we, we did lobby for Medicare not knowing that it would come with all the hoops that it's come with. Yeah. Um, but it was certainly something, you know, back then we, we were trying to make it an affordable option for women, you know, um, without... Well, yeah, I mean, it's turned into something completely different now, unfortunately. But um, our our intention back then was to, to, to have some funding for it so women could afford it without any sort of loopholes or, you know, um, regulation around it. But it's become very highly um, regulated now, unfortunately. But that, that wasn't our intention to start off with. Um so, yeah, so I was very involved in all of that. And what was I talking about before that? I can't remember. Um, so we were, yeah, so getting into midwifery. And oh, that's what right. That so, yeah. like for you. So you were finishing up, well, not finishing up, you're doing the childbirth and the doula education. Yeah. Um, and so then, then the local home birth midwife up here in the mountains approached me and asked me if she could employ me as a doula to come to her births with her. So she paid me, actually. It wasn't the women. And she she said, I need a doula. <laughs> yeah. So it was great. I mean, it was yeah. fantastic for me. It's I, kind of like an apprentice, isn't it, in the um, – yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, I wasn't physically doing anything a midwife would do apart from um, the physical support. I wasn't, you know, listening to fetal hearts or any of that stuff. But just to be – I mean, I was going to three home births a month as a doula and – just to constantly be around that all the time and, you know, I learnt so much from her. Um, and then she retired and that's when I decided well, that there was no midwife in the mountains. So, And it was the um, the B mid had just started. I think it had been um, happening for a year. Um, so at the time Pat Brody was the, the College of Midwives president. She's an amazing woman. And they managed to get the legislation changed so that midwifery was a separate profession to nursing because prior to that they were both bumped into the same um, registration. 
So they managed to change the legislation to, to change it to a different profession, which then opened the paved the way for there to be able to be an actual bachelor and midwifery degree rather than having to do nursing first and then midwifery. So that was a real, that was a massive thing to have happen. So um, you were like the, one of the pioneer students of the Bachelor of Midwifery then? Yeah, I think I, I think I was second in the second year cohort. Wow. I think I was second or maybe it was third. But, yeah, it was one of the first ones. Um, and once that started and then the midwife that I working with retired and it was all just and um you know my kids were all going off to school I was like okay I'm ready to go so I went and did the the three-year degree um and it was a huge I mean none of it was online back then and it was a a huge task of you know it was an hour and a half each way and I, I was gone from seven in the morning till seven at night most days um thankfully my husband was around a lot so he because he did shift work um he was around heaps, and I had this fa- fabulous woman, um, single mum that lived up the street that I paid to help me before and after school. Um, but it was full on. It was really full on. I, I look back on that time, and I'm like, I don't know how I did that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I did, thank God. You know, I mean, it's t- it's really tough, especially coming from my background having, you know, I mean, most of the births that I went to as a doula were home births. I only went, I didn't go to that many really hospital births. Um, and I'd had home births myself. And, you know, going into, as a student, going into the hospital system and just being completely horrified by what goes on in there. I mean, I, you know, I, used, I often came home crying from what I'd seen that day. You know, it was just unbelievable to me. Mm. Um and, uh, you know, I, I never intended to ever – I mean, I went into midwifery with the intention of doing home births. I never, ever intended to work in the hospital. I never wanted to. You know, it was never something I'd planned to do. So, um, and, uh, you know, there are some – I don't want to take away from the fact that there's some absolutely amazing midwives that work in the hospital and I absolutely take my hat off to them, but it's not what I wanted to do. I know now to get into private practice it's like three years or 5,000 hours, something like that. Was that the – similar route then no so I, I went straight into private practice yeah um I had had a lot of experience though with a home birth midwife so I think my confidence was that's where I felt comfortable I didn't feel comfortable in the hospital setting setting up epidural trolleys and doing induction that just I was, I was completely out of my comfort zone there in that space and my total comfort zone was in home birth and you know I'd been to you know, probably nearly 100 home births before I even did midwifery. So um, oh, it was probably not that many, maybe 70, something like that. And so, you know, I, I, I can honestly say I learnt more by attending those births and just being, an, you know, a physical support to the woman and an onlooker to the midwife than I did in any lecture. It's really hard being in clinical placement in the hospital setting. Um, I met some beautiful, amazing midwives there and I met some bloody terrible ones. Um, and learn a lot about what, how I wouldn't practice really. That I learn about a lot about what not to do. What advice would you give to someone that's in the thick of it and really wants to get through it, but you know, yeah, it's sort of head down, bum up, and you have to get the work done. What what advice would you give to someone to get to sort of help get through that? Um, well, I, I had a bit of a, a mantra, I suppose particularly during the births that I was at as a student, was that if I can make the slightest little bit of difference to this woman's birth experience just by being kind to her, then that's what I'm going to do. And and that kind of got me through, you know, like just being really present at the births and listening to what the women said. I mean, sometimes that could be difficult because obviously you're not, you know, you're there to learn and you're not making decisions or clinical decisions based on what's happening with the woman but even just just being kind because some midwives are really not very kind um so that helped me get through knowing that you know just being there might have made a bit of a difference to that woman's experience and I think trying to get yourself a mentor that's on a similar um that has a similar philosophy to you so somebody that's already working as a midwife that you can you can ring up and debrief with or, you know, ask for some advice for or cry on their shoulder um, and just keep the vision of where you want to go. Keep that as your vision. 
there are going to be hard times that will it's part of it unfortunately it's part of the journey of becoming a midwife um but hopefully hopefully i mean you know we i know that there's a real saying that midwives eat their young um and i'm hoping that 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 culture is changing and there's many more lovely midwives that are wanting to support students into practice that are happening now more so than 30 years ago you know yeah good advice thank you so studies completed and you got through it um take us through your first birth as a qualified midwife in private practice yeah so I had been she was having her fourth baby um she'd actually I was still a student when she contacted me so she I wasn't a qualified midwife yet but she but I was going to be by the time she birthed so she was I'd finished in the November and she was due in the December (laughs) so she had all of her antenatal care um at the hospital and then a month before, once I had completed my degree, she changed over to me and I saw her for the last four um, antenatal visits weekly, you know. But I had been her doula twice before for home births with the midwife that I'd worked with who was now retired. So we, we had a relationship and we knew each other. Um, and it was a beautiful, yeah, it was a beautiful water birth. It was her first boy, so she'd had three girls and then a little boy. Um and it all went swimmingly well. But I really felt that I kind of thought that my first year out would be, you know, it had been such a full-on three years doing uni. I sort of felt that it would kind of be a nice ease into private practice. I'd just get a few births and it would be really nice. But And it was really nice, but it wasn't like that. I, You know, I, I was, yeah, I got booked up pretty quickly. And I think that's, you know, one, because people knew me. I was very visible in the home birth movement in the mountains. Um, and two, because there was just such a lack of midwives that it was like, yay, finally there's a midwife, let's go. It's like the misty mountain midwife. That... <laughs> the misty mountain. <laughs> yes, it's very misty in Katoomba. Yeah, it is, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's, definitely I... no, there's definitely no riding push bikes to mountains births. So it's all uphill. Yeah, I can just picture you driving around, at, you know, like just before dawn and it's nice foggy weather and you've just come home from a birth and... <laughs> It's totally what it's like. Yeah, you know, it totally is. Yeah, I love it. Okay. Love it. Yeah, great. So, and how like to to boot now? How many births do you reckon you've attended? Have you stopped counting, like a lot of midwives. Yeah, I haven't. Yeah. I wish I'm really annoyed that I have stopped counting. I mean, I could go back and work it out because I've kept a, I've kept a register of since I started home births um, as a midwife. So I could go back and work it out, but I'm probably. I mean, I do between 30 and 40 a year and I'm in my ninth year, so what's that? I don't know. Mm. I have no idea. Yeah. I'm a really mathematician, but quite a few. Joe, I still count with my fingers. So, <laughs> so do I. <laughs> <laughs> so do I. Yeah. It's terrible. My husband yeah. laughs at me all the time. Yeah. When I... Where you're at now, so nine years into private practice and I'm sure many people are familiar with Australian home birth private practice system at the moment. It's going a bit... Askew. Uh, so I'm doing research um, into the to- the name of the research is um, experiences of private practice midwives who have been reported to APRA. So it's midwives that have been under investigation or reported to the regulatory body um, because we know that it's a, I mean, anecdotally, we know that it's absolutely rife amongst home birth midwives, but there's no research on it. There's nothing. So, um, which proved to be very difficult when I had to do a literature review on the topic and there was nothing. So then I changed the literature review to midwives' experiences of home birth because most of the home birth research out there is women's experiences, you know, consumers. And there's very little on midwives. So um, through that, I found little tiny snippets in the in the literature from different countries about, you know, midwives' fears being reported and that sort of thing. Um so there's definitely a big gap in the literature around that topic. Um, so, yeah, I'm I'm still right in the middle of it. So I haven't got any findings to share with you. But what I can say is it's really bloody depressing, mm. and it's very difficult to. I've done all my interviews and I've transcribed them all, and I'm at the point of I've coded it and pulled out the themes, and I'm at the point of really starting to write in the thick of it. And um, it's really hard to do. I, I do have to keep walking away from it because it's very close to home and it's really depressing, yeah. yeah. So yeah. God knows how I'm going to present this information at conferences and try and keep it 
I don't know. Anyway, um, and you know, it was sparked by for me the the passion has come from the fact that my own midwife was deregistered um, in a very public way. You know, she was across the front page of all the newspapers, and you know, it was a bloody awful time. And you know, myself and Lou and a few other key people were some of the main supporters of her through that. Um, and it was absolutely horrendous, and it was a complete witch hunt. Um, and yeah, that sort of sparked my passion for it. And then, of course, once I became a midwife, well, as the as the convener of Home Birth Australia, we'd, we'd be contacted by midwives for support that were going through these sort of investigations. And, you know, none of them were ever reported by the women. The, in fact, my, the majority of, people, of them, the women, were in support of the midwife in court, and it was the obstetricians or the hospital staff or whatever that had reported the midwife. Mm. Um, so that's so typical, like a transfer or something like that where... Yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so then I had... Then I became a midwife and then I had colleagues that started to get reports. And so then I was really supporting them through, you know, I've sat in on a few um, panels and stuff like that as a support person for midwives that have been going through an investigation. Um, and then I was reported... Um, in my, I think it was third year out, um, after a transfer, the local hospital, somebody from the local hospital reported me. And, I mean, it, I ended up being fine, found to have done nothing wrong, but it was still a really stressful nine months of investigation and paperwork and handing stuff in and not knowing whether they were going to put conditions on my registration or whether I'd be able to continue to work or, um, you know, but I did get through it and I've come out the other side stronger for it and really passionate to do this bit of research now. So mm. as Hannah says, turn the wound to gold. We set up um, some meetings with the local home birth midwives and the senior midwives from the hospital and we'd meet at the time it was once once a month or once every two months we'd meet. And the first one was a bit uh, yeah, it was interesting that you could cut the air in the cut the air with a knife, you know, in the room. But then, as everyone sort of let their shackles down and just relaxed into it and started being honest about how things were, um, you know, relationships started to build. And you know, for us, we could go, okay, you know, these people are trying to do the best they can within the constraints of the system that they work in. And for them, they could see these people are trying to do the best they can and they're not just turning up with home births with a drum and a bit of incense. They are actually professionals. Um, and it and it really did break down those barriers. And one of the things that I remember one of the midwives said was, you know, when we come in for a transfer, we've likely been with that woman. You know, one, we know her really well because we've been with her for the last seven months and know her intimately and her story. So, you know, you can use us as a resource, you know. And two, we've likely been with her for a really long time. So when we come in, it would be really nice if you said, do you want a cup of tea and a sandwich, you know, rather than it being a really hostile environment. And that's exactly what the next time I went in for a transfer, that's exactly what happened. Mm. They said, do you want a cup of tea? Do you want?" They said, do you want a sandwich? And it was a cohesive experience and collaborative experience where you know we worked together to get the best best outcome for that woman and it and it ended up being really good yeah, so yeah. yeah I think if you know you've got to you can't go in at transfer in and not be willing to share information and have a bit of a, a barrier up and go oh we're here at the hospital like you you're there for a reason and you need to make sure that you that you're building relationships with the people that are there because it's important that you do it's important for the women that you work with as well all right so as a student midwife and i'm curious about this myself how easy or hard is it to get into private practice and what is your thoughts on the outlook of private practice in australia especially yeah okay uh well a lot has changed since in the short time that I've been doing it, um, you know, when I first finished uni, you didn't have to be Medicare eligible to, to work in private practice. Um, and now you do. And it, that's actually a requirement of the insurance company. So there were, there were several insurance companies that were offering insurance to privately practicing midwives and all of them have pulled out bar one. And that one insurance company requires that they'll only insure Medicare eligible midwives. So in order to be at Medicare eligible, you have to have had three years post-grad experience, um, full-time experience. 
So it's cutting out a whole heap of women uh, that have gone into uh, as student midwives hoping to become private practice midwives pretty quickly once they finish. So for me, I wouldn't have been able to do what I did if I'm doing it now. And actually, I don't know if I will, will, would have done it. You know, in hindsight, if I was starting now and with those requirements, that would be six years before I could actually start practicing as a home birth midwife. Um, and that feels really daunting and big, and it would mean working in the system for three years. So I don't know if I would have chosen to do it if that was the case. I'm, I don't want to put anybody off, though, because we need a new generation of midwives coming through. So it's really difficult. It's becoming increasingly difficult to be a private practice midwife in Australia, particularly supporting women to birth at home. Um, you know, we're, you, we're all about... Oh, sorry. Are you, sorry. Are you seeing no, no, many students... Um, approaching you or being through the three years that are looking to go into private practice at the moment? No, no, very few. I mean, I have, I've, I have just been, um, uh, what's it called? Um, I, I'm starting to take on students. So Western Sydney University are doing the bachelor midwifery um, course, and they're allowing students to come out with um, privately practicing midwives as one of their. It's called an alternate alternate model of care. So as one of their um, placements, clinical placements. So I, I do have a student starting with me in June. For, I think she's coming for a month, which is fabulous. I'm so happy about it. Um, because when I was a student, we weren't allowed to go out with the home birth midwives. So it's great that they're offering this. It's fantastic. Yeah, I know of a few that it is their intention, but now they have to work for three years before they can, before they can do it. So... It's really hard. It's very, very difficult, and I don't know what the answer to that is. Um, I think we need to we need to be able to have new grad midwives come out with us, you know, and be able to provide antenatal and postnatal care to women because that this is the problem, you know, with a second midwife coming to the – this is another problem, needing to have two midwives at every birth, um, particularly for rural women because in many places – there's only one midwife, let alone two, just supporting women for home birth. So I know that there's, I mean, I know it, there's lots of midwives stopping practicing because they don't have a second midwife to come to birth with them. Um, so th this is presenting another problem. Um, you know, and we're all about woman centered care and keeping the woman right at the center of the care. But around that, we've got all this crazy regulation that's you know, I feel like it's way over-regulated and it's definitely affecting women's choices. You know, we've got the requirements of the Nursing and Midwifery Board. We've got the ACM guidelines for referral and consultation. We've got the safety and quality guidelines for privately practising midwives. We've got the national company standards for the midwife. We've got the National Health and Medical Research Council guidance on a collaborative maternity care. You know, it just goes on and on and on. The ACM transfer for planned home birth guidelines, the requirements of the insurance company. Um, and, you know, it's this minefield of paperwork and legislation and regulation, and it's becoming so crippling to the midwives that many of them are stopping because it's just so big. Um, you know, we're, we're now told that we're going to be ha having random audits of our notes. Um, and, and, you know, it just, it's just making it – it feels like the midwives are getting so stitched up that it's making it almost impossible for them to support anyone that – is even slightly outside what's considered, you know, um, recommended guidelines. And we know that there are many women that choose home birth in, in a very, very informed way. You know, they're making informed choices because they have had things happen to them in their previous births and in the system, and they don't want to go back for seconds. But because of those things that have happened to, happened to them, they're considered outside guidelines. And like I said before, I'm one of them. You know, I had that 1,500 mil PPH. Um, and then I wasn't allowed to go back to the birth centre. So we, you know, the the whole, I don't know what the answer is, but I do know that, you know, APRA and the whole um, organisation is that this is to keep, this, this is for the protection of the public. We're protecting the public by making these midwives really regulated and, you know, networked into the system. You know, it seems like a one-way collaboration more than a, a two-way collaboration, but anyway, that's another story. Um and yet, because of that, we know anecdotally the free birth rate's rising. So are we actually protecting the public by doing this? You know, there are a lot of women that are choosing to free birth that wouldn't otherwise choose to free birth, but they can't find a midwife to support them. 
and that's not a good good enough reason to have a free birth. You know, it's not it's not good enough. It's really not. But I don't know what the answer is, Ali. I really don't. Do you know how many home birth midwives are currently practicing in Australia at the moment? I don't know. I mean, there's this is the thing as well because there's eligible eligible midwives, and there's many midwives that are, who have become eligible that are just off that, that are just providing antenatal and postnatal care. They're not doing any births. Um, so it's really hard to rate how many are actually attending home births. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, there's the odd. What is there a handful of publicly funded home birth programs around Australia? But you know, their their entry criteria, selection criteria, is so strict. You know, I mean, I, I remember, you know, when there was a a local one in Sydney that that started up you know, a while, a few years ago, and we'd be getting, you know, all the home birth midwives would be getting calls from women when they're 37 weeks pregnant saying, you know, I've been planning this home birth my whole pregnancy and now I've been kicked off the program because I'm GBS positive. Will you take me on? You know, it's like so all the, the, the independent or the privately practising midwives were then getting the women that were getting kicked off the the home birth programs, and many of us couldn't take them on because we were fully booked, you know. And, and in Sydney, I know it's a real problem. Like I'm... I turn away at least five women a month from from because um, I can't take them on. And it's just not just me. It's all the midwives that are working in Sydney, not that there are that many anymore, um, because there's such a lack of them and, and the, the um, you know, people are wanting to have home births, but there's not enough midwives providing it. And I don't, how, how are we going to get the next generation of midwives through and coming to births with us and learning about home births? Because it's a very different way of working um, if they're – if there's no insurance and if they're actually not allowed to be there and they can't and they have to work in the system, you know, I'd, something's got to change. It's got to, the, the pendulum has got to start swinging, swinging back the other way. It has to. What, what do you feel is sort of driving this um, deregulation process of private midwives? Because oh, that seems what's happening. It seems like the, it, it just wants to deregulate private midwives and get. I think that's. What, I think that's exactly what is what's wanting to happen. I think they want to. Well, they, the big they. I yeah, think. Who's they? I, I don't even know who they are, <laughs> but I think there is a push to eradicate home birth midwives, and I think they'd like to have home birth through the public um, public maternity system, which is great. I mean, you know, it does give another option to women, but it will leave out a whole heap of women, and what are those women going to do? Yeah. You know, many, I mean, I have many women who are planning vaginal births after caesareans, and, you know, I feel like, I mean, probably a third of my clientele, actually, and you know, those women have been so traumatised in the system and, I mean, Hannah Darling calls it refugees of the system, you know, that they're so traumatised that they, they are absolutely not going back for seconds. And, you know, without a midwife that's prepared to be with those women and, you know, form a trusting relationship because that's the basis of what we do is, you know, have a, have a relationship with the woman that's based on trust and respect and, you know, support her informed choice. Um, without that, where, where are they going to go? Because they're not going back. They're not going back in. So, you know, women are going to home birth, whether there's midwives to help them or not. They, they'll find a way to do it. And I just don't feel like this is – I feel like we're just getting to a point where, you know, we, we're we going to completely eradicate home birth midwives and then and then what's going to happen? I don't know. We'll see, won't we? Yeah. Be free mm. birth central. Yeah. Well, that's right. The doulas will step up into the roles that, yeah. you know, the midwives used to have, which is why doulas, are, you know, why the whole doula profession happened anyway. You know, when you look at when you look at countries that have got great continuity of care midwifery models, there are very, you know, doulas, it's not even a, really a profession. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, the doula profession has been created out of such a fragmented system here and, and a lack of... Um, well, a lack of midwives that are really doing the job that they should be doing. It's very hard. How would you like to see it? Would you like to see, like, the sort of typical NHS model with, you know, the private... Well, they wouldn't be private midwives. They'd be employed by the hospital and attending home births. I would. I'd love to see that. I think um, I think all, all women should be able to have that choice, um, but it needs to come without all the hoops and all the rah-rah. You know, if women are making an informed choice to have a home birth, even if they have slight risk factors, 
Um, and you know, as long as they're making an informed decision, and they've 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 had the conversation probably with more than one midwife or more than one doctor, um, then they should be allowed to do that, and it shouldn't that shouldn't have to pay for it. You know, it's uh, home birth in this country is very much a white privileged middle class thing to do. Yeah. Middle, middle to upper class thing. I mean, it's an, it's an expensive thing, yeah. and you know there there are many many women at it from lower socioeconomic um, areas that could really do with the sort of care that we provide. I mean, it is gold standard care. It's one to one continuity of midwifery care. You're never going to get it anywhere else, and um, you know, but they can't afford it. And yeah, so I think you know it would be fabulous if it was funded. But it, it, you know, as soon as something's funded, it's then run by government, yeah. and you know there were going to be rules and regulations around it. There just are. So yeah, it's difficult. It's really difficult. And we know you know through the publicly funded home birth programs that are that are are up and running that there are many women that that can't access them because of tiny little things. They're too fat. They're too thin. They're too old. You know, First they baby. Way, you know. <laughs> And imagine, imagine being that. Like I, I find that really hard. Like I, I put myself in that situation, and maybe, you know, maybe because I've come from a consumer into midwifery, and I've come from that sort of consumer activist role, and you know, a woman having babies at home, um, and then you know, my career is built, turned into a, a career of midwifery. Um, I, I do still very much wear that consumer hat, and maybe sometimes a little bit too much for my own good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and if that's even a thing, is it too much? I don't know. Um, but, you know, I, I put myself in that situation and think, imagine, imagine, you know, having been planning this home birth your whole pregnancy for 38 weeks and then right at the last minute you kicked off the program. I mean, it would be devastating. It would be absolutely devastating yeah. for, for a reason that particularly if you don't feel like you, you know, that you, that you should have been kicked off, you don't feel like you're that high a risk or, you know, you're prepared to take that that chance that you know there might be something that's slightly, slightly awry, like GBS positive, um, you know, yeah. So um, I recall with my birth, um, my second home birth, my second birth being at home, was there was this point that I really resonated with the fact that this responsibility is mine, and no one has as much stake in this as myself, and that's yep. to go with my health and this birth and everything that the responsibility really laid on me and my decision and I had midwife that I trusted and respected but ultimately this was me and my decision and my body (laughs) and it really just hit me and it was a very empowering feeling. Absolutely and I think you know I mean women that choose choose free birth because they want a free birth that's completely valid and okay and a completely, you know, cool thing to be doing if that's what they want to be doing. But when women are forced into it because they can't find a midwife or they can't afford a midwife or, you know, they've been kicked off a program because they're considered high risk or whatever, then for me that's not okay. No. You know, and, that's, it's, and it's going against what you would be hired as. Uh, not Well, it's going against midwifery is to protect and keep them safe in, with the best knowledge that you've got. Um, it's kind of going against that if you can't find those people to support you yeah. in that because it's leaving you alone and isolated. And um, That's right, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. You know, and it just feels like, you know, with the way that midwifery or private practice midwifery is going, I mean, I, you know, we've even stopped using the term independent midwife for fear of it, us being independent of a system, you know, but... Yeah. You know, and I love I love that that terminology, but everyone says private practice midwife now, so we've gone to that. But um, you know, it's you know it's almost a requirement now that we are heavily networked into a system, which you know it can be a great thing when we need to transfer or when we need to consult and refer and, and collaborate with with that system. But that shouldn't have to be for every single woman. You know, there you know we're, we're professionals in our own in our own right. You know, we we the keepers of normal birth and we understand really well physiological normal physiological birth and you know to think that all women should have should have to collaborate with a doctor in order for them to get their medicare funding for for their home you know for their antenatal and postnatal care for their home birth it just it just seems like a very one-way 
collaboration. I mean, the doctors, we have to collaborate. We don't have a choice but to. We have to, but they don't have to with us. They can just go, no, I don't want to collaborate with them. They're some, you know, hippie that turns up with, you know, (laughs) a drum and a bit of incense to the birth. And in terms of change, I mean, the women need to get up and have the, you know, they need to stand up and start shouting from the rooftops again because it feels like the consumer activism really isn't there. Yeah. So Um, Hannah Darlin said this. So how would you see it? What would you like women, consumers, us to do? Um, I think they need to start rallying again and, and start, you know, lobbying. There's no lobbying happening. They need to start lobbying governments and, you know, be saying this is not good enough, this is what we need and want because, you know, when women aren't, aren't saying it, you know, it's no point in the midwife saying it because no one's going to listen. It, it, seems, it sounds like we've got a vested interest in making this, you know, this maternity system work for us. Um, so it, it needs to come from women and I guess, you know, have really good – um, coordinated plans on how to, you know, who, who to, you know, the health minister and who to, to speak to um, and start getting women all over the country saying, you know, this isn't good enough. These days it's like, you know, you, you feel like you, you sign a petition and you've done your bit. But, you know, and it's it's all very faceless and it's all we're all keyboard warriors. But actually getting out there and really speaking to the people that we need to speak to, the politicians, really it's the politicians that need to hear this stuff, writing, you know, letter-writing letter campaigns. I mean, gosh, back in, you know, early 2000s when Maternity Coalition was really, really, um, you know, really big and really heavily lobbying, and that was when Justine was at the helm and, you know, we had these um, postcard um campaigns where, you know, they were literally postcards that said all women um, should be, I can't even remember what it said, but it was about continuity of care, one-to-one, all women should have their own midwife. This is just a basic human right, you know. And you just signed it and you stuck a stamp on it and you posted it to your local MP, you know. So there was really good coordinated campaigns happening and it just seems like there's such a lack of that at the moment. Um and That's again, a great idea, isn't it? We can flood them with actual physical letters as opposed to just filling up their inbox with emails. Yeah. So we well, that's exactly that's flood exactly their office. <laughs> that's exactly what we did. Yeah, it was. And we had some great rallies, you know, like amazing that the big one in Canberra where 3,000 people showed up. That was amazing. I would really love before we wrap it up to talk about birth time to leave it on a really good great. positive note. So, uh, midwife Joe slash filmmaker (laughs) (laughs) want to be yeah Yeah. um so birth time came about really from what that uh, movie the doc i was telling you about before the labor of love yeah so when i saw that and then watched it again recently and it's very 80s it's very set in the 80s and i was like we need to we need another one of those could maybe we could do a labor of love too this was years ago and um I mean, I didn't have the know-how nor the – I didn't have a clue anyway. I'd been looking for this woman. The woman that made, um, produced and edited The Labour of Love, her, her name's Harriet Clutterbuck, and I'd been looking for her and I, I didn't know – you know, I had no luck in finding her in the birth world. And I had this amazing experience two years ago, almost to the day, of this these, this gorgeous um, – couple, two, a female, two women couple, lesbian couple, who were having twins and they were planning a hospital birth, but I, that employed me as their midwife and we were going into the hospital to have the babies, but I was giving them all their antenatal care and collaborating with the hospital. As it turned out, she was going to need to have a Caesar because she had a placenta previa. But cut a very, very long story short, one of her babies was born very compromised and um, after 11 days, it was decided that they needed to turn off all the machines and let her go. And she was intubated and we navigated and collaborated with the hospital to take, the baby's name was Willow, to take Willow home to die. Um, and it was the first time this had ever been requested with an intubated baby at our local hospital because, you know, when a baby's intubated, they're on all the machines with the oxygen going in and it's it's a big deal. So we managed to negotiate it and um, they had to bag the baby in the car the whole way with the oxygen. And then once we got there, they extubated her and then they left and left. It was just me and the two women and the baby. And she lived for about 20 minutes on her own and then she passed away and we had probably 
it was about 15 hours after that at home with her and they asked me to stay with them and they did all these beautiful things that, you know, they bathed her and wore her in a hugabub and danced with her and took photos and footprint. It was just divine. I mean, it was very sad but just beautiful in, in its thing. But the, to cut it, what I was trying to say about that is that the mum, the birth mum, Rebecca, asked her best friend to come and be with the second twin, Eden, who was still in, in Niku to be with her while we took Willow home so that um, there was someone with Eden, you know, that someone from a, that loved her that was going to be with her for as long as – because we didn't know how long it was going to take. We thought it could have been days that Willow had have lived, you know. Um, so this woman was Harriet Clutterbuck, the woman that went and stayed with Eden. It was amazing. Oh, wow. I know. So I got, you know, since then I've, I've met her for, for dinner a few times and we've we've talked about potentially making another doco, but I still needed help. So um, in came my friend who also became a client, Jerusha. She's a beautiful um, birth photographer and doula and home birther now. He's got a little six-month-old. And um, she was like, yeah, let's do it, let's do it. But we still didn't quite know how we were going to go ahead. And then um, Zoe, I think you've interviewed Zoe before, Zoe mm -hmm. Naylor, she, Jerusha filmed her birth and photographed it and I was her midwife and we got talking to her about it and so, and she's like a, an amazing entrepreneur and also is in the know being an actress. So she was like, yeah, let's do it. So the three of us went, okay, let's do it. So we all put in some money and, and bought, um, you know, sound equipment and lights and all the rest of it, not having a bloody clue what to do with them and having to YouTube it all to work out how to work it. Um, <laughs> and so we started making this documentary. But what happened was um, it's turned into something much bigger than the Labour of Love. It's The normal Labour and Birth Conference was happening in Sydney and we had interviewed Hannah Darlin the week before it um, for the for our doco. She was at the first sort of cab off the rank that we were interviewing. And she said, Joe, I've got all these amazing people coming to Sydney from all over the world next week for the normal labour and birth conference let's you know you've got to interview them so amazingly she set up and organized a room for us at the back of the conference and gave me all of their contact details or no she she put me in contact with them so she emailed them first and made sure they were okay to hear from me and um, all these amazing people from all over the world agreed to be interviewed at the back of this conference so we were kind of just thrown into it at that stage like we didn't have a really clear vision of where we were going to go with it. Um, but because it happened the week before, and so we just went with it and um, have got incredible footage of people, you know, birth activists and researchers, and and it's still ongoing. So this is a, yeah, our intention is to have a, um, a trailer done by November, which will be the Home Birth Conference in Sydney, which is where it will be launched, oh, the trailer. Wow. And then, um, and then we need to crowdfund because we need to pay an editor. Like we, n none of us have that skill or know how at all, and we want it to be really professional. So, it's going to cost about fifty grand um, to to pay an editor. So we're hoping to crowdfund and get enough money to pay an editor. And then once we've done that, it'll hopefully come out. I don't know how long it takes to edit something like that. Probably six months. So. Yeah, but we've got amazing footage, amazing interviews. Um, you know, Jerusha and Zoe's births have both been filmed, which they, they will there'll be snippets of those in it, and we will do a couple of other um, women as well, um, and lots of um, interviews with women who are birthing. And so the overarching question that we're asking is, um, what what will it take for women to emerge from their births physically well and emotionally safe. That's the big picture of what we're looking at through the doco. So it's exciting. So in general with your interviews, uh, is that – so you're just using that overarching theme and then just gauging your questions around that depending on who it is, I guess? Yeah, yeah. depending yeah. on what their expect expertise is and what their experience is. And, you know, the plan is to be – you know, the women's stories will be in it and then everything that they're saying that they want or did or didn't do will be all backed up by the researchers yeah. saying their bit, you know, but, but with scientific evidence. So it sounds like you probably need two documentaries. With like, <laughs> you, can, you kind of opened a can of worms there, Joe. with that one. I know. It's a bit bigger than Ben-Hur at the moment. Yeah, but that's great. It'll happen. Yeah. It'll happen. Yeah. Yeah, excellent. And so you got a few international 
people, obviously. Um, but are you going to keep it more focused on Australian system? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, there will be a little bit about other systems. I mean, uh, Anc de, de Jong, who did that huge um, uh, home birth study in the Netherlands, I think it was 100,000 people or something. I don't, don't quote me on that, but there was a lot of home births that she studied. I mean, she was at that conference and we interviewed her and talked about the system, the maternity system in the Netherlands. Um, and, you know, there's like the the Leslie Page, who's the president of the, uh, the Royal College of Midwives in England. She was there and we interviewed her. Um, there was Melissa Cheney, who did a massive home birth study um, out of America. We interviewed her. Um, yeah, there's, it's amazing. It was amazing, the people that we met. It was like I, I was just having a little, you know, yeah. I was... I was having a little groupy moment. You would have been, especially for like a birth nerd such as yourself. You would have been totally. like, yeah, it was great. Oh, that's it was fantastic. So cool. That's fantastic and inspiring. So, 2018, stay tuned for birth time. It's time, birth time. It's time, birth time. I think the <laughs> Facebook page is called. You have to tell me what it's called. It's, um, I, th- I think it's birth time documentary. Yeah. Yeah. I'll just have a quick look. Is it there? I know, I know you always hashtag birth time, don't you, with your... Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah great. So check it out. And, you know, like okay. I, I was... Oh gosh, that's a, I was thinking that's a lot of money to raise, but then I was looking at, um, you know, some of the views on some of the things that we put up on that page, and some of them have got, you know, 6,000, 7,000 views. Yeah. I thought, well, if everyone put in $10... Yep, there you go. There's the money for the editing of, yeah. the, of the documentary. So, I mean, I remember the business of being born, you know, Justine Keynes and I organised the, uh, I think it was 2008 Home Birth Conference in Sydney and we got Ricky Lake and Abby Epstein out for the conference and it was the Australian premiere of the business of being born. And, you know, that we, we showed it at the, home, at, you know, the, on the Saturday night of the Home Birth Conference and opened it up to a whole heap of other people that weren't at the conference. I think there were about 500 people there. And Ricky and Abby were there and they did like a Q&A at the end and all the rest of it. And it was amazing. But so many people came up to me after that and said, but it's in America. Yeah, I'm like, but yeah. you don't understand. It's exactly what's happening in Australia. I mean, we have the we have the same cesarean section rate in Australia as, as in the States. You know, the only difference in wording is Pitocin compared to Syntocin on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think, um, I think doing a similar sort of vibe but with it, you know, with an Australian focus, so that people really see what's going on, yeah, um, and and what choices are available to them, yeah, as yeah. well, um, yeah, exactly, so, to see, yeah, to see what's going on and open ourselves up, but in a supportive way where we're not again singling out, you know, where to birth. It's not about yeah. that. It's about you know finding that support and bringing it all together. And I'm excited about it. So absolutely, <laughs> and you know, I'm not. I, I don't think home births for everybody. I don't. No, I think definitely not. No, but it needs to be an option for those that want it. So yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah, all, it, it, yeah, it all does. I mean, whether you want to birth with Tibetan monks somewhere, or whether you want to have this, you know, the you feel more secure in the hospital having an epidural. It, it just doesn't matter. Like it's it's the way you feel and the way you're supported in making those choices. It's yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So that's exactly right. And um, I think that. Therein lies the problem, really. That you know, the answer, the answer is continuity of care. I, I think, yeah. um, you know, and, and for those women that want that continuity at home, then that should be a, a, as valid a choice as the people, the women that, you know, want to have an elective cesarean section. Like, you know, pe- women can choose that, they, and they can choose that on the public purse. Yeah. And yet, a woman can't choose to have a home birth. You know, have a baby in a lounge room. Yeah. yeah. With no intervention. You know, it seems absurd thank you joe we've, well thank you i've loved it we've oh, chatted for nearly an hour and a half or well, like oh all my, my podcasts they just go forever which is amazing so it's all good <laughs> that's lovely to chat yeah and um i will be sure to post all the links that you've talked about um during this episode um, for anyone that's interested especially with like home birth australia and home birth access sydney um birth time um, and yourself as well. Awesome. Well, we've got a great conference coming up in November in Sydney. Yep. Maggie Maggie Banks from from um, New Zealand and Millie Hill from the Positive Birth Movement from London. They're the keynote speakers. So come on down. Yes. It'll be fun. Yep. Uh, tickets are available now, aren't they? 
They are, yeah. Yep. Beautiful. And Zoe's birth video will be showing. Zoe's emceeing the, emceeing the conference and her, yeah, it's, um, she, I think she's opening it with her, with Bo's birth video. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Did you connect with this episode? Then head over to our website, circleofbirth.com. There you'll find show notes, pictures, resources, and potentially connect with today's storyteller. Don't forget to sign up to be updated with new empowering episodes and content. Help the show grow by contributing a tip in the jar to make sure we can continue to better the podcast and connect more and more to the wisdom of birth and each other. Hey, and don't forget the iTunes rating. This has been another episode of the Birth Share Project. We breathe, we birth, we empower. 